So I'm going to talk about something Mike talked about, which is duration, risk, or balance sheet mismatch. I'm also going to talk about the derivatives market. So at least that's something that Mike didn't talk about. And then what all this has to do with Federal Reserve policy and why I think what the Fed is doing is really misguided. And just to give a preview, I think the Fed did need to raise rates. They should have started doing it earlier than they did, but they should have stopped at 3.5. And, and I'll tell you why uh, in a bit. Uh, inflation, where is it going? Um, what does this all mean for commercial real estate? Again, to some extent, this is going to overlap Mike's presentation. And then something completely different. I've been kind of obsessed with population growth in the US. And I'm going to show you where I think it's going to be. And it's different from the most recent census projections, which are too old. They come from 2018, and the census needs to, and by the way, I love the census, but they need to recalibrate what they're saying about population. And clearly, population matters a lot to real estate, right? Without people, you don't need real estate. OK, so um, I'm just going to do this a little more slowly than Mike did it. Uh, Imagine a simple bank balance sheet. And think about it, pension funds are the opposite of banks. Is banks, all of their liabilities are liquid, all of your liabilities are illiquid, right? You don't get to touch, as a pensioner, your money until you reach a certain age, right? So to some extent, you guys should be loving the market as it is right now, because you can invest in long-term securities at a higher yield than you could a few years ago, and it's going to be easier to meet your targets now than it was a few years ago. You're not so happy if you bought long-term securities two years ago because you're stuck at that lower rate. But with a bank, you have the opposite problem, this duration problem. So suppose your assets are 10-year zero-coupon treasuries that are paying 2%. And there were a lot of regional banks that were doing this. I mean, of course, none of them are 100% in this. but. Your liabilities are, take two forms. You're, again, a regional bank, so you have deposits or your liabilities, and then you have capital. Uh, so big banks will use bond financing, but regional banks generally don't. So their money is coming from deposits. Uh, and the capital is, capital is raised by the bank either through the issuance of new stock or retained earnings. So this is not the equity value of the bank. This is the book value of the, the cash that's come into the bank. Okay. So this looks like a lot of regional bank balance sheets from th two years ago. And sometimes, yeah, it wasn't zero coupon treasuries. It was home mortgages. So I have one of those mortgages at the moment. Uh, that it's, not a, it's a, um, not a Fannie Freddie loan. It's the bank has it in portfolio. Um, and I can talk to you about why that is if you want. But OK, so here you are. And you know, you say, and I've talked to a CFO of a bank about this a year ago, of a regional bank, and I said, you guys got a problem. And he says, no, we don't. We have no credit risk. And I said, I know you have no credit risk. You still got a problem. OK, so this is what Mike was talking about. So here is the national deposit rate, the, av the average rate on deposits. Um, Versus, these are not money market accounts. These are just, this is literally deposits. Or it's not certificates of deposit. This is stuff that you can go take out of the bank immediately, right? Versus the one month constant maturity treasury. And I think the one month is the most relevant because if you think about one of the most important functions of a bank is acting as a utility for payroll, for corporate payroll, right? So you need. You're a corporation. You need access to your money once a month, maybe every two weeks. Depends on how you pay people. But it's basically you're, you're thinking about rolling over your money to pay your people. And so forget about small depositors. If you're a company and using your bank for payroll, you're going to look at this gap. And you're going to start saying, this is stupid. I want to minimize the amount of money that I have in deposits. And I think anecdotes are, you should never use anecdotes to demonstrate that something is true, but you can use them to illustrate a point. Right? You need data to demonstrate that things are true. OK, here's the data real quick. Here's, we had the biggest decline in deposits in a short period of time that we've had since we've been measuring these things, okay, which is because of this. My anecdote is this. On 
I mean, fairly early on, I said to my wife, we should clear out our checking account as much as possible. We should just have enough you know, to pay them. We're comfortable with it, like two and a half months of bills in our checking account. And otherwise, we're in treasuries. And by the way, if you're not in treasuries personally, it's really easy to get into treasuries. They have a very nice website. You can buy one 28-day treasuries. You can roll them over. It's, it's really easy to do it. But that's, you know, it's, it's sort of like I have to have the lowest mortgage rate possible because given my job, it would be embarrassing not to. And similarly, I need to be paying attention to, like, where my risk-free money is. Um, but on the very same day, my daughter, who is a podcast producer, and my dad, who's a retired physician, called me up. And they both had the same question. How much do I need to keep in my checking account? Because they wanted to know, you know, from a household management standpoint, they never really thought about it before. And I thought, and my, you know, my daughter's very smart. My dad's very smart. I'm basically the dumbest person in my family. But they're not thinking about finance on a day-to-day -day basis. And I figured, my gosh, if both of them are calling me the same day with the same question without prompting from me, if I were a good son or father, I would have prompted them. OK, this is occurring to other people as well. And so what happens when money flows out of banks, they need to start selling assets in order to redeem those deposits. OK, and so what happens to that 10-year note? OK, what Mike showed is what the market priced it at. And here's one of those few things in life where finance theory nails it. Finance theory gets it exactly right what the price in the market is going to be. So assuming this zero coupon bond, $100 today will become $122 in 10 years at 2% because of compounding. But the current 10-year rate is roughly 3.5%. It's been fluctuating between about 3.3 3 and 3.7. So I'm just going to say 3.5. So if you were to buy a new bond today, it produces $141 in 10 years. So divide 122 by 141, that's the value of that 10-year bond now, which is about 86 cents. Okay. Now, what Mike put up there was home mortgages, and they have longer 30 years instead of they have longer duration, so they're going to be a little more sensitive. But the point is, that's where that decline in value is coming from. There's no default. You're going to get exactly the cash flow that you're promised. And yeah, we should make a small adjustment, because we really, that bond we bought a year ago is now really a nine-year bond. But it's because nine-year money costs about the, I'm not going to worry about it too much. Um, OK, so now what happens to this market market balance sheet? And again, Mike basically showed you another version of the same thing. Your zero coupon treasuries are worth 860000 Your deposits are still 900000 So now you're, you've gone from plus 100000 to minus 40000 in capital. Now, I'm going to say, so I'm going to preview. Why did I stop? Had the Fed stopped at 3.5% in terms of short-term rate, assuming the yield curve was similar in shape to now, you wouldn't have banks underwater. So that's why 3.5% is, in my view, where they should have st stopped. They should have recognized the pressure that they were putting on banks. And this is a quote that annoyed me. To, I mean, it, it's a quote, things keep you up at night. This keeps me up at night. This picture keeps me up at night. OK? This guy named John Williams, he's head of the New York Fed. New York Fed is the Federal Reserve Bank that does open market operations. Okay. This is a quote from him. I doubt monetary policy spiked banking sector stress. OK. I call on that. The man, I mean, that, this guy has a PhD from Stanford. OK, now, OK, it would be better if he had a PhD from USC. But you know, he has a PhD from Stanford. He, should, he knows better, is the math says that when you raise the discount rate on a fixed income asset, the value of that asset falls. He knows what the balance sheets of banks look like. The more the Fed raises rates, the more they put stress on banks. Until the Fed reverses, there is going to continue to be pressure on banks. And I think the Fed is right now playing chicken with the banking system. Okay, Maybe we won't see any more failures. I'm not sure. Now, there's a facility that allows banks to basically post collateral of their treasuries at par, even if they're worth less than par at the moment. 
and people are saying this solves the liquidity crisis, but it basically crisis, but it basically turns a potential one-time disaster into a drip, drip, drip kind of torture because they're still banks are still borrowing at the federal funds rate. So if they have a two percent treasury on their balance sheet and they have to borrow from the Fed at five and a half, you know what? They're losing money on that. And we're saying, I mean, earnings are not going to be pretty for the regional banks for any time, some time to come. That's going to get priced into the stock. Depositors will become aware of this, I think. I, I, I think until the Fed reverses, the pressure is going to continue to be on banks. It's going to continue to be a problem. I hope you don't hit the breaking point, but I will say last, and, and Suzanne and Chase can confirm this, starting last August, I was saying, man, I hope nothing bad happens because of this. And then SVB happens, and by the way, I got a bunch of emails the next day going, wow. Okay, SVB didn't need to happen. There were other things wrong with SVB besides the duration mismatch, but didn't need to happen. Okay, now part of it is under the Dodd-Frank law, there is a really big gaping hole. And I want to be clear, this aspect of Dodd-Frank doesn't apply directly to regional banks. It only applies to the biggest banks, but nevertheless, it's going to send a signal to regional banks. And the whole is this, is when a bank invests in treasury securities, it needn't put any capital behind those securities. So to put that in context, when it makes a small business loan, it has to put capital of 8% behind that small business loan, assign 8% capital to that. So if it wants to grow and it wants to do small business loans, it has to raise capital. Okay. When it does home mortgages, they have to put 4% capital behind it. When it does um, mortgage-backed securities, it has to put a little under 2% capital. Okay. So the idea is you are assigning risks to these different loans, and um, the riskier the loan, the more capital you have to put behind it. Well, there was this view, well, treasuries are zero risk, so you don't have to put any capital behind treasuries. Short-term maturities, you know, T-bills, one-month T-bills, yeah, that's fine. 10-year treasury securities have risk. They have balance sheet risk. They have interest rate risk. Banks should not be investing in these securities. And yet, what signal are you sending to banks if you say you don't have to put capital behind long-term treasury securities? Oh, they're safe. And of course, the people who are running banks right now didn't live through the early 1980s, the late 1970s, which is the last time we saw a big run-up in interest rates. Interest rates have basically been falling through their entire lives. Uh, I worked on the implementation of Dodd-Frank. Uh, I worked in, so Ed gave his political affiliation. I worked in the Obama administration. I was part of an interagency task force on the implementation of Dodd-Frank. I asked the people at Basel who came up with these risk weights. Where did you come up with the risk weights? And I thought there was going to be some econometric model or something. They said sounded, they sounded right. OK. The risk rates, aren't, so that's how policy is often made. I, I'm proud to say, when I was really, that's not how we made policy in the Obama administration. We may have been wrong, but we really relied on empirical evidence for doing what we did. Um, it's part of what was fun about the job. All right. so. What could you do? Well, you could hedge this risk, right? Banks can buy what are called pay fixed receive floating swaps. So um, I can make a deal with, I'll pick on Cindy because she was a student of mine once. Uh, I can say to Cindy, I'm going to pay you 100 bucks. And in exchange for that, if rates go above 4%, I'm just going to pay you 4. So I'm going to pay you fixed. And you're going to pay me the floating rate. And so I'm hedged against that eventuality of short-term interest rates going up, right? And the big banks did this. There are a couple of big bank strategies in terms of managing interest rate risk. JP Morgan basically doesn't have any to begin with. I mean, they have, it's why Jamie Dimon loves interest rates going up. Because they are basically, they're not just, it's not so much that they're hedged as their balance sheet is immune to interest rate risk at JP Morgan. When they make short-term, when they make loans, they tend to be floating-rate loans. So, you know, the rates on their assets and the rates on their liabilities move together. But Bank of America has a lot of fixed-rate debt on their balance sheet, 
um, that they've issued. But they've done a lot of hedging. So they're aware of this risk management. So you say, yeah, OK, it's all right. And of course, the, what developers do is they buy interest rate caps. Uh, Mike VK talked about if rates go down even for a little while, buy these caps as quickly as possible. But the problem is these are exchanged. These swaps are exchanged in an exchange market. I, I'm sorry, not in an exchange market. They're over the counter. What that means is there's no transparency. And there's no need to post collateral. So when you invest on an exchange and you invest on margin, you have to prove every day that you have the collateral to meet your obligations. And if you don't, you're basically in default. The exchange takes over your position. They make sure the investors on the other side of the get trade get paid. You are insured. When you do an over-the-counter market deal, there is no such insurance. So you have this problem of counterparty risk. And I have a story about what made me acutely aware of counterparty risk, because I worked at Freddie Mac for a while. And one of the things I worked on at Freddie was managing our interest rate risk. It was part of a team that worked on managing our interest rate risk. And I remember there was a Thursday morning. We always had the meetings on Thursday mornings. And I was feeling great about how well we were doing in managing our interest rate risk. Well, we did do a good job. And we were always aiming for one month duration okay, risk. So not complete hedging against interest rate risk, but largely hedged against interest rate risk for the same. I mean, the, the principle of insurance is you actually don't want insurance to make a first dollar payment. That's not a good insurance policy, because your premiums are going to be much higher. You want to take on a little bit of risk, just so long as it's not catastrophic. The idea of insurance is to provide insurance against catastrophic events. Otherwise, your premiums are too high. So like, you don't want first dollar coverage on your car unless you're in a position, financial position, where you really need a car and you really need that first dollar coverage. right? So I was feeling good. I was having lunch with uh, the guys on my team. Sorry, they were all guys. And I asked at lunch, so what could go wrong for us? And this guy named Brian Surrett, who went on to run risk management, credit risk management for Capital One, says, well, we could have counterparty risk. And so you know, we're kind of nodding our heads. And I said, so who are our counterparties? And another guy says, uh, Don Bradley, I remember it. He said, oh, it's our, our biggest counterparty is Lehman Brothers. And so we all started laughing, like, OK, this is in 2003. No problem, right? We're good. Okay. As far as we knew, Lehman Brothers was, as you know, the gold standard of counterparties. This is what happened to AAG and Goldman Sachs, right? Is why AEG was bailed out. It wasn't that anybody cared about AEG? Is Goldman Sachs shorted the mortgage market? I'm proud to say that. Again, a student of mine was part of the reason they were shorting the market. A guy named Michael Marchon. You read the big short, he shows up there. But the problem was they were had AEG on as their counterparty, and AEG didn't have remotely enough capital to meet their obligations to Goldman Sachs. And so had AEG gone under, Goldman Sachs would have gone under. And after the impact of Lehman failing, the Treasury didn't have a lot of hunger for letting Goldman Sachs fail. And you asked Ben Bernanke afterwards talked about how he didn't regret bailing out Goldman Sachs. He said we had no choice. But he regretted by how much they bailed out Goldman Sachs. So basically, it didn't cost them anything. It should have cost them something, just not so much that it bankrupted the company. All right, so hedging is, uh, I worry about hedging, too. Hope I'm wrong about all of this. Hope I'm wrong to be worried about this going forward. Um, if you want to remember me a year from now as the guy who was completely wrong about being too worried, I'm cool with that. All right. Now, what about inflation, which is what the Fed says um, is the dragon that it's trying to slay? Well, CPI rent is 40% of uh, CPI. The problem with CPI rent is that we look at it wrong. Because rents can move a lot, but it doesn't show up because we only sign about 1 12th of leases each month. 
So the monthly rental CPI index doesn't reflect what's happening right now. It reflects the weighted average of what's happened over the last year. Right? Make sense? OK. And so these guys, who I'm happy to say are indeed friends of mine. They're really nice guys. Ambrose Coulson and Yoshida have their own CPI index. And what it does is this, is it looks at about 150,000 rental units around the country. And it looks at what is their rent today on new signings compared to a year ago. So they're controlling for location. They're controlling for quality of a unit because they're looking at what did the same unit sign for today versus a year ago. And you can see what happened is they got the upside right. You can see how the, the we have the two um, rental price indexes, the uh, uh, CPI and the PCE. Is See how much more slowly they go up than what's happening monthly? And it's hard to see it now, but it's starting to turn downward. And it will plummet. Because if we look at monthly rents, overall they have plummeted. And, and this may surprise you. I'm going to show you why that is in a moment. Because you may think, how could it be? That's not what I'm seeing in our markets. What you're investing in, you're not seeing the kind of plummeting that you're seeing in the overall market. Because you don't do two to fours, right? And two to fours are half the market. But this implies that the CPI rent component is going to start falling very rapidly. The CPI rent component is 40% of inflation. And just mechanically, if you work through their numbers, you should be seeing the headline inflation number come down to between 2 and 3% sometime this fall. It's not clear whether it's September, October, or November. But one of those three months, the headline CPI number should be below 3%. And at that point, I think there's going to be some relaxing around inflation. And that should at least cause the Fed to pause, if not start to drop rates. So again, you can remember that I said that. And if I got it wrong, again, you could talk about that joker who said inflation would be in the twos to threes. But it was mechanical. This is a mechanical forecast. This is not like a, I'm making some sweeping grand assumption in order to come to that number. It's basically plugging in these numbers that are real into the weight that they add to an inflationary number and more or less holding everything else constant. And you, um, and you should see CPI start to come down pretty dramatically this fall. And we are seeing that trajectory falling right now. We were in the fours in the most recent um, CPI report. So if I'm right about this, and by the way, the whole banking thing, when I started worrying about that, that's again, it's mechanical. You don't need to be a theoretical genius. As Ed McCaffrey said today, it, it's you don't need to run calculus to do this. All you need to do, well, you could run calculus, and it helps. The first time I explained this to a group, I used the calculus, and I lost everybody in the audience in about 15 seconds. So other thing, of course, about banks right now that make them more vulnerable is it's just so easy to get your money out. right? So back in the day, at the building and loan, and it's a wonderful life, you had to actually go through Jimmy Stewart to get your money out. And there was a Jimmy Stewart there to say to you, you know, your money is in Ed's house over here, and you know, we can't sell his loan tomorrow. And when you didn't make your payment last year, we didn't foreclose on you, did, did we? And do you think Potter would have done that? So right, there's friction that kept people from getting their money immediately during the Great Depression. They still went and got it, largely. But, but it couldn't. Whereas, of course, nowadays, you can get your money whenever you want in an instant. Right? Just go online. There it is. Out of the bank it goes. You can wire it from one place to another. You can use Zelle to send it from one place to another. It's not hard. And so Bad news has a, there's no opportunity to even for a minute explain to people, oh, we have this liquidity facility. It's all right. It's, that's why I, I'm very nervous still about the banking system. All right. Let's talk about commercial real estate for a second. And 
you know, I admire the Green Street people very much. And so what Mike showed you today was very helpful. I tend to look at REITs and trying to figure out what's happening to cap rates. But I also have a model of cap rates. And let me explain what all this nonsense means is I think the correct benchmark for looking at cap rates is not 10-year treasuries, but tips. And the reason is, if you think about what is a cap rate, a cap rate is some required rate of return less expected growth in rent. Right? That's why cap rates can be, why you can have actually negative leverage sometimes. Because if you're counting on rent growth, cap rates are going to be lower. OK, tips, I'm sure everybody in this audience knows. Treasury inflation protected securities are a way you could buy a treasury and have complete um, hedging against inflation risk. So if you buy a 1% tip, that means a year from now you get 1% plus whatever CPI growth was in the last year. I bonds are basically the consumer form of tips. And so I use tips as a benchmark for cap rates instead of treasuries. And as, a, as an empirical matter, they work better. right? Your aggressions work better. Your fit works better um, when you use tips instead of cap rates. And what I want you to focus on just for a second is this number here, 0.27. Okay, And this is the Southern California apartment market. I have different numbers for different markets, but I'll give this as an illustration. What it basically says is a one percentage point change in the tips rate leads to a 27 basis point change in the cap rate. Right? OK. So what's happened to tips? In the last year and a half, they have risen from negative 1% to a little over 1%. So about a 225 basis point increase in tips. Okay, multiply that by a little more than a quarter, and you get about a 70 basis point, 65 basis point increase in cap rates. That's what I think has happened to cap rates in the private market and apartments in Southern California. Now, they were at four. They go up to 4.65. What does that mean? That's a diminution in value of about 14%. Okay, maybe there's a little NOI growth, but really not very much. So that's about where I think apartments are worth. It's hard to know, right? Because there are no transactions, particularly in LA. We heard why. I mean, after um, April 1st, which is when Prop ULA kicked in, there have been no transactions. I mean, it's nothing. Um, and so um, I'm guessing, because we don't observe, but you know what it means is even a good product type, you're seeing values down 14%. Okay, so. Cap rates are only the beginning, though, because you know, commercial lending rates for trophy properties have risen from 3 to 6%, leading to a 50% higher payment for the same loan balance. That's assuming a 40-year amortization. Okay. As a consequence, LTV really isn't the issue. It's debt cover that's become the issue. Right? So you might say, yeah, there's loads of equity in the building, but if I'm keeping my debt cover where it was before as a lender, if I'm not moving on my debt cover, then you're still not going to get enough of a loan to do a refinance because I don't have enough. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Here's an example I did that just shows where we move from LTV being the binding constraint to debt cover being the binding constraint. So that, again, until the Fed reverses so that commercial interest rates come down, you're going to have a problem with people having to bring equity to the table, or people are going to have to get mes debt out of debt funds or something in order to finance refinances. And boy, are there a lot of them coming. So this is bank CRE loan maturities coming up in the next couple of years. And as you could see, right, there were a lot of people who did refinancing in 2010, 2012. 10 years later, what's going on? They need to get new loans. Now, I, I think it's still the case that, I mean, if you had bought a building in 2011 and you were underwriting based on that NOI, you're probably fine in terms of getting a refinance. But if you're in the five-year bucket, if you got a building in 2018 or 2019 and you need to re refinance it in 2023, 2024, that's going to be really tough to deal with. OK, clearly fundamentals matter, too. I'm going to talk at some. But you know the office NAREIT, just again using REITs is a pretty good 
metric for what's going on in different markets. Um, it's down 44% in the last 12 months. Compare that to apartments, 15, industrial, 7, retail, 7. Why are apartments worth, I'm gonna, worse than the other two? I'm going to show you that. I mean, industrial, everything is still full, right? NOI is not a problem. Um, on rollovers, lease rates are still going up. The basic problem with industrial is there are too many 10-year leases out there, and so there are people who are stuck with lower rent than they otherwise would have hoped. But the, the industrial market is just good. And retail, you know, we probably finally got to the point where we reached uh, demolition equilibrium, is we've torn down enough stuff around the country that retail, again, seems pretty healthy for the first time in a long time. And, and the nature of the stuff that's working is, is the necessity, real stuff, re retail stuff, the grocery, drugstore anchored stuff. Though even some of that, I mean, Walgreens, beyond the San Francisco stories, we're seeing Walgreens shut down in different parts of the country. Uh, so there may still be a little bit left there, but um, it was also trading at very high cap rates before. So, you know, it's, retail's not. First time I can say this in a really long time, retail's not bad. But what's going on? Why are apartments worse? Because we know there's strong demand for apartments and so on. Well, I think this is, relative to the last panel, I do think one of the ways you solve housing problems, it's not the panacea, but you build a lot of housing. So this is the census quarterly vacancy rate by MSA in the US, and you know, I think the people at CoStar do an excellent job. This is not a diss on CoStar, but CoStar doesn't do two to fours. CoStar, CoStar does five and above. So when you're looking at their vacancy rates, that's for about half of the housing stock that's rented in the US, a little under half, as a matter of fact. When you add in the two to fours, this is what happens to your rental vacancy rates in the United States. And, and one of the things that is a key statistic Ken Rosen taught me this many, many, many years ago. It's out of a paper he wrote in 1975. Uh, is 5% is about the vacancy rate at which rent stabilize. So they don't go up, they don't fall. And it varies a little from one market. Some markets may be four, some markets may be six. A lot of it depends on how much turnover do you have in a market. Right? Because if you have basically moving at the rate at which people move out determines what's called the natural vacancy rate. If people stay in an apartment for two years and then move out, think about it. You, you have a 4% vacancy rate just baked in. Because when somebody moves out, it's going to be a month before somebody moves in again. Just to market the place and fix it up and, and so on. So 4% is sort of the minimum vacancy rate you would expect to see in a market which has the very typical two-year rental tenure. So notice that most markets now have an overall vacancy rate, excuse me, above 5%. That's very different from what it was. I should have had the comparison from two years ago. And what's really stunning is look at Charlotte, Houston, um, Raleigh. These are Dallas. These are rapidly growing markets. Atlanta. And you have vacancies sometimes in the double digits. Okay. This shows you can build your way to more affordable housing. I mean, think about it. Dallas. You saw the Texas map on Ed's slide. Is Texas is more, had more people move into it than any other state. Among Texas cities, Dallas has, had, Dallas has grown much faster than Houston. It's now growing faster. It wasn't, but now it's growing faster than Austin. But you know, in Dallas, there are basically no impediments to building. It's why, by the way, as an investor, I still think of LA as a better, despite what's going on in LA, what I'll say is LA outside of the city of LA, Southern California, is still a great market. You go back 30 years, the market with the most rent growth among all our major MSAs has been metropolitan Los Angeles. That's LA and Orange County. Dallas has had been a laggard in terms of rent growth. Why is Dallas a laggard in terms of rent growth? Here's why. It has high vacancy. Why does it have high vacancy? It builds a lot. So if you care about policy and affordability, you love Dallas. If you're an investor and you care about long-term returns, you hate Dallas. This comes to the intractability point, right? Is people's motivations are different. 
All right. That's why you're seeing those plummeting rents nationwide, is we have a lot of markets right now with a lot of vacancy in them. And that's why apartments, in terms of their valuation, have done somewhat worse than we've seen in industrial and retail space. Finally, what about owner-occupied housing? Well, something we have seen is a turnaround. We, we saw a little bit of a dip in um, house prices from about a year ago, but that's clearly plateaued and started to turn around. This is April. That's the most recent case Schiller month. Uh, you know, there were people who were predicting, by the way, if you go on YouTube, you'll find all these people who say we're going to have another 2008 in the housing market. We're not. Biggest difference, there are a lot of differences, but the biggest differences are one, unlike 2008, rents have gone up a lot, so your choice of owning and renting is not renting is much more appealing than it was in 2006. I remember in 2007, we were living in Washington in Bethesda, Maryland, and I said to my wife, our house is overvalued, we should sell it and rent. And she said to me, okay, if you take care of everything, selling the house, moving the whole shebang, we can do that. She knew that that meant there was no way it was going to happen. So, uh, no, there are real frictions to moving, right? But, but the point is, I, you know, I was looking at my street, and suddenly, you know, my story is, I never thought I'd own a million-dollar house. It was crazy. I don't know. We spent less, far less than half of that in 2002, and by 2008, it was a million-dollar house. I thought I'd never own a million-dollar house. And I looked at the people moving into the street, and I thought, how can they afford a million-dollar house? Because they were like, we'd have new associates at law firms, and the spouse didn't work, and so they were making 150K, and I'm doing the math, 150K in income, million dollar house, those, that, those don't go together. That's not going, I mean, the underwriting has been very strong. And the other thing, of course, and I'm sure you've read about this at some length, is people are locked into their houses with their very low mortgage rates. I mean, if I were to ever have to move, if, you know, the People at USC got wise to me and said, you know what, sorry, but this is over now. You're gone. I'd rent out my house. I wouldn't sell it. I could have a 2% mortgage. Why, why would I give up a 2% mortgage? That's a valuable asset. So it's not particularly surprising that we had this short um, run. But the other thing is, if you look at the relationship between real house prices and real mortgage rates, which is to say, on an inflation-adjusted basis, what happens to mortgage rates and house prices? A 1% increase in mortgage rates leads to about a half percent decline in house price. No, about a 5% decline in house prices, excuse me. And, but that's real house prices. So remember, we've had underlying inflation of 7 to 8%. So house prices going up 2% is a decline of 5%. Okay, real mortgage rates have gone up about 2 So house prices should real house prices should have fallen by about 10. So that's after taking into inflation account. And that's almost exactly where we are right now. And again, that's based on econometric modeling. So I'm not surprised that we're there at the moment. I'm going to switch gears entirely for the last uh, seven minutes and talk about population. The motivation for doing this was uh, a developer came up to me and said, we're going to be as bad as Japan soon, aren't we? And I said, I don't think so. And he said, so show me. So OK. That's what this is. We're not going to be as bad as Japan, but there's something to worry about. So I'm going to look at a number of countries, the US, Canada, Japan, and Korea. So what I'm going to use is the most recent mortality tables that are available. Um, and again, this is something, as people who manage pension funds, you should be looking at mortality tables on a regular basis, because it will tell you how much money you're going to need out there, right? The longer people are retired, the more money you're going to have to provide them. This is one of the few audiences where what I'm about to show you may be looked at as good news instead of bad news. But I, I'm going to use both the 2019 and 2020 mortality tables for the US because they're very different from each other. I'm going to assume the following fertility rates. This is where they are currently. So there's no assumption about them falling or rising. Um, 0.06 in the US. This means if you look at women between the ages of 15 and 44, 6% of them had a baby last year. That's how we measure fertility. Um, Canada, 0.045. Japan, 0.04. Again, those are the actual numbers. South Korea has the lowest fertility rate in the world at 0.027. 
And that's a mystery to me because South Korea is a really nice country with a really nice economy and food's good and the infrastructure's good and the education is good. Uh, so I kept asking Koreans, why is their fertility rate so low? And they said, well, they all live in these little boxes. Their housing units are very small, so you know, they don't want too many people in each box. Uh, I don't, maybe, I don't find that entirely convincing, but it's an interesting phenomenon. Anyway, um, immigrants per year, assume uh, a million US immigrants a year. That was the total number last year, documented and undocumented. Three quarters of a million documented, a quarter of a million undocumented. Canada 260, Japan 110. So notice Canada's 260 on a population base that's one tenth of ours. So the immigration rate in Canada is about two and a half times what it is in the United States. Japan, they basically don't have immigration. Um, the share of immigrants that are women of childbearing age, the US is 0.27, Canada 0.32. Again, these are real data. Japan, I actually have no idea, but again, it doesn't matter because they don't have immigration. Um, and then this is the female immigrant fertility rate. Again, this is real data. Uh, in the US, it's the same as native uh, born women. Um, in Canada, it's a little higher than the uh, women who are born there. Japan, again, it's a guess. Again, it doesn't matter what the guess is. And before I show you what all this means, I just want to show you the depressing graph is this is life expectancy by these countries. And the US is the red. And what you could see is we have had a big decline in life expectancy. And it is not COVID, because all of these other countries went through COVID as well. And if you look, I mean, yeah, Canada took a little hit from COVID. Um, the green is Japan. You can barely see anything. Korea is the purple. You got a little bit of, well, no, you, you don't see anything. So in the US, remember, it starts before COVID. So it's not old people getting killed. This is young people dying of drug overdoses and suicide. So it's what is called deaths of despair. And this is, again, I wanted to not send you to lunch on a low note, but <laughs> it's a low note. OK, you put this all together, what do you get? OK, this is what's going to happen to the relative population of the US, Canada, Japan, and Republic of Korea. And I'm going to show you two graphs. This is a graph that's based on zero, because I always believe presenting graphs with the zero crossing the y-axis so I'm not misleading people. I hate graphs where the, you know, the y-axis starts at 0.9 and the top is 0 0.90002. And then you see all these squiggles in between that look like they're real, they're not. I don't want to mislead you, but it's sort of hard to interpret this. So now I'm going to zoom in and with a base of 80%. And this is population projection. You can look, Japan is still is falling by far the most rapidly. But the interesting thing, if we look at the US, we peak in 2035. OK, again, and this is based on the data-based assumptions that I shared with you going in. Um, and you notice Canada, I mean, it's a little later, but even though they have a lot more immigrants than we do, which is why they have a bigger jump, they're still going to see declines because of that very low fertility rate and lots and lots of people entering the last years of their lives. OK. Um, Last thing I want to share with you that really matters to real estate is the US population projections for young adults, people between the ages of 25 and 34. And as you can see, it's already dropping, and it's dropping pretty quickly. And so if I'm thinking about real estate, I'm thinking very hard about this. And it's why, by the way, I'm bearish on office for a whole host of reasons. I was before the pandemic. And by, I'm not bearish on it. I was bearish. I was bullish on industrial a long time ago. Apartments, I'm still pretty bullish on. But this is an issue. It might help with the housing affordability problem, right? Fewer younger people leaving the market. And with that, it's time for lunch.